In chapter 2 of Ephesians, so far, Paul has talked about the great work that the Lord Jesus has done on the cross through His death. By shedding His blood on the cross for our sins. He is our peace and He made both the Jew and the Gentile one. By breaking down the middle wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances. Christ removed the hostility. The reason for the hostility between the Jew and the Gentile. The temple of God was built by human hands, was out of bounds for the Gentile. The Gentile could not go beyond the court of the Gentile. But now they have direct access to God through the blood of Christ. The Jew and the Gentile have become one body. And we read this in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no male and female, sorry, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The glory of God that dwelt temporarily in the temple built by hands, now dwells permanently inside each one of us. And we collectively form the body called the church. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that God's Spirit dwells in you? And we see that as we become part of this body, the church, there is true unity in this body, the church. True unity is now possible because Christ died for us. True unity is only possible through the cross of Christ. When we talk about unity, we are not talking about superficial unity. Superficial unity is temporary. It fails in the midst of difficult circumstances. When we talk about true unity, we are referring to an organic, vital union between people. It's like our body parts. Every single part is a vital unity, a unit with each other. This is why true unity is not possible by human efforts or some human treaty. True lasting peace is not man's creation. It is clearly the work of the Holy Spirit Himself. How? Through the cross of Christ. And as we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, as a result, the Jew and the Gentile have come together into one humanity one body, the church also called, a.k.a. the Bride of Christ. Today, we are going to be looking at what it means to be part of the body of Christ. What are the privileges to being in the body of Christ? The Christian population today, by and large, is largely mis misinformed on the understanding, or the true understanding of the church, the Bride of Christ. For some, church is a nice thing to attend on Sunday morning. I mean, if they are not doing anything else. Or if they were now too late Saturday night, and they didn't have to sleep in. They attend church, like they would attend a theater for enjoyment and to make them feel good. Gallup poll shows that church attendance in 2017 in America was about 38%. For other professing Christians, they attend church as spiritual consumers not to serve the bride of Christ. They shop around for a church like they would do at Walmart and Target, they shop around. If they like the service at the church, they stay back. If they feel bored and feel that the church isn't meeting their needs, they leave and they find another church. Their evaluation of the church is not based on doctrine or biblical truths being expounded, but on the programs and the worship. As a result, 
Many churches are not preaching on sin. I mean, they may sprinkle the word sin in their sermons, but not to a point where they would step on your toes or make you feel uncomfortable, because even many churches want to make their customer feel good. So they would come back, and they can do business. Some are just looking for Christian church. I mean, even cults can be classified these days under Christian churches. There are some who will attend church for worship, one church for worship, because to them worship is the singing, and they would leave right after that to attend another church for teaching. Only goes to show the consumer mentality of these people. Joshua Harris in his book, Stop Dating the Church, writes, Most Christians are dating the church because they are not married to it. He says the reasons are, first, they are me-centered. Second, they are independent. They don't want to get too involved, especially with people for whatever reason. Maybe they got hurt or burned at another church. Third, they tend to be very critical of the church. As we come to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, and if you have your Bibles, I'm reading out of the ESV, Paul demonstrates to us the privilege that we have of coming together into this body called the church by means of three word pictures. He builds up the understanding of the church in verses 19 to 22, so that you and I would be motivated not just to date the church, but to immerse ourselves into it, have a form of commitment that comes in marriage between a man and a woman. So the things that he's telling us in 19 to 22, he says first is that we are fellow citizens. Second, we are members of God's household. And third, is that we are living stones or building blocks of the temple of God. Now Paul's intention from the beginning of chapter 1 is to help us understand our privilege as believers. So that you and I would be able to truly praise God as a result of our understanding of the privilege that we have in Christ. We need to be reminded that we are saved by the blood of Christ that was shed on Calvary. We need to be reminded that as a result of trusting in His death on the cross for our sins, we are forgiven. And that we are now made part of this body called the church. So let's read verses 19 through 22. Chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, and from the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. As we read verses 19 to 22, we have three headings that emerge. Number one, we are privileged to be fellow citizens in God's kingdom. Number two, We are privileged to be members of God's household. And the third one, we are privileged to be living stones in God's temple, verses 20 to 22. Let's look at the first heading. We are privileged to be fellow citizens in God's kingdom, verse 19a. Let me read that for you. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Stop right there. When you think of words used in 19a, like strangers and aliens, 
and especially fellow citizens. We can refer to a kingdom or a state or a country. And Paul says here, we are no longer strangers and aliens. It's contrasting our new position with our past. You and I will never be able to treasure our new position unless we understand who we were without Christ. As we look at the word strangers, strangers are people who find themselves among a people not their own. You go outside, you find some time, someone and say, he was a stranger, you don't know him. As a stranger, you do not belong to a group, you're an outsider. The second word is the word alien or foreigner. Someone who lives in a community but is not in it. He lives in a city but he doesn't belong to the city. He's like a foreigner living in a place which is not where he is born. He does not have his residence there in that city. He's not a citizen of the city. To get more clarification on this, we can actually turn to Romans chapter 9, verse 6. You don't have to turn there. I'll read for you. It says, They are not all Israel which are our Israel. Meaning, as you read that, it says, There is an Israel in the spirit, and there is an Israel of the flesh. There were some Israel that belonged to the company of the true Israel, yet were not part of the company. That's the meaning of the word foreigner or alien. That can be said of the church as well. As we read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, it reads, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not all of us. So yes, according to this passage, there were people who walked with the church, but they were not of the church. They seemed to be Christians, but they never really belonged to the church. So how do you know if you are no longer a stranger and an alien? How do you differentiate between a stranger and alien from the true citizens in God's kingdom? Well, an answer, a simple answer would be if you're a Christian, a fellow citizen, you're no longer like the rest of the group. Now you know when we talk about nations and state and kingdom, we know they all have boundaries. There are boundaries that separate people from other nations. Nations have specific rules for citizens and those who are not. In the same way, Paul is very clear with the use of the word fellow citizen. He is saying a Christian cannot be a, cannot be a Christian without being a separated person. A Christian cannot be a person without coming under the rules and regulations of the kingdom or the state or the country that he belongs to. You cannot be in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan at the same time. There's a fundamental difference between these two kingdoms. This is what we read in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4. It says, we were delivered from this present evil world. So yes, if we are not delivered, we still belong to the present evil world. But if we are delivered, we now belong to the kingdom of God and we are fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. Not there. And in the same way as we have boundaries and we have rules, every state, every kingdom has a ruler. There's a head of the state. Or the king in a kingdom. And, and if it is a kingdom, the citizens of the kingdom are bound together in allegiance to the king who is a supreme authority. It's the same with the church. We have Jesus Christ who is the king of the church. He is the Lord of the church. And as Christians, as fellow citizens belonging to God's kingdom, we give allegiance to the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ. 
And because we belong to the same kingdom, and because we we worship the same God, and because we have the same word, as believers we also have allegiance to one another as well. That's part of being fellow citizen. So not only are we a separated people, not only are we having a allegiance to a ruler whose kingdom we belong, we owe allegiance to one another as fellow citizens as well because we belong to that. It's like when you become part of a country, you owe allegiance to the people within the country. Now there have been people who claim to have been in church for decades but do not know Christ as their Lord and their Savior. If Christ is not reigning in one's life, then one is not in Christ's kingdom. This is what Paul asserts in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. He says, you, the Ephesians, you, if you are saved, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints. This is very important that you and I know who we are. Because if you don't know who you are, then it's only a matter of time before trials of life come your way and you will fall away. The reality of your life, the reality of your belief will be brought to the surface. This is why 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 clearly says, Test yourselves. Examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize this about yourselves? That Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We do. We do have to. Because that allows us to see who we are. You know the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. Don't have to turn there. Whenever anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, it says the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. It was like the seed that was sown on the roadside, on the pathway. As for what was sown on rocky grounds, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, endures for a while. But what happens? When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word of God, immediately the Bible says such a person falls away. Or, if you are a seed that is sown amongst the thorns, is like the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So it, it's important that we realize who we are in our faith. Are we men and women of the faith? Do we believe in Jesus Christ? Are we still strangers and aliens, or are we fellow citizens in the kingdom? How do you know if you are a fellow citizen in the kingdom of God? What are the evidences of true saving faith? I put together a few here. One, you will love God. You will love God continually. You will want to know Him more and more. This is what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. And so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Or what about Psalm 34? It says, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, O Lord. You will love God. Second, you will love the people of God. First John chapter 3 verse 14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. True believers love God and love God's people. Third, you are drawn to prayer. Romans chapter 8 verse 15, You do not receive a spirit that makes you slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God draws us into intimacy and prayer with the Father. Four, 
you will study and obey the word of God. John chapter 14 verse 21 and 24 says, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. As clear as that. And fifthly, you will continually be putting to death sin in your life. You will mortify sin before sin mortifies you. You will kill sin before sin kills you. We read that in Romans chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And if none of these characteristics is true of you in practice, I did not say in perfection. Did I say in perfection? No. I said, if none of these things are true of you in practice, that means if there's not a pattern of your life, then you're still a stranger and an alien to the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Paul continues in verse 19. He says, you're no longer strangers and aliens. Let's move forward. There's a con contrasting conjunction there. But... You are a fellow citizen with the saints. Paul goes on to say that we are fellow citizens with the saints. The saints here are all the redeemed people from Old Testament and New Testament time. And Paul in this context may have the New Testament saints in mind. But as you read Hebrews chapter 12... Verses 22 to 23, we read, By you, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That means we are citizens, according to this passage of Hebrews chapter 12, of a heavenly Jerusalem. And we belong to the innumerable company of the fellow citizens. Even as we talk about belonging to a kingdom, we need to remember that this kingdom here is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's a kingdom that will have no end. It's an everlasting kingdom of God and of Christ. And as fellow citizens, we are belonging to this kingdom along with the saints. Now as fellow citizens of this kingdom, we have many privileges, many benefits. Ephesians chapter 1, if you turn a page down, you will find in verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. We are blessed with what? With spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Romans 8.32 We read that he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also give us graciously all these things? All resources of the Godhead are ours. That's our privilege as we belong to the church. Not only that, we have access to God, our ruler, our king. Sometimes, all the time. We have a king who is always interested in our welfare. Never so busy that he's not personally involved in our lives and cares for us. That's what the Bible says in Jeremiah. It says, call unto me and I will answer you. That's why the Bible says in 1 Peter, cast your anxiety upon me. For he cares for you. This is a reminder that our king, the king of kings, 
the Lord, majestic, sovereign, is always available for us. Always available for us. That's a blessing. That's a privilege we enjoy as we belong to his kingdom. As we are fellow citizens of his kingdom along with the saints. Let's move on. Paul continues in, in verse 9b, and this is where we come to the second heading. We are privileged to be members of God's household. And we read, but you are, let me read 9, 19 all together, and I'll tell you where we begin, b. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. That's 19a. And now we come to 19b. And members of the household of God. Household means family. That means as believers, we belong to the family of God. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. We read this. You may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, a.k.a. It just does not there, I'm paraphrasing it, which is a church of the living God. That means Timothy said, Paul writes in Timothy, he says, the household of God is synonymous with the church of the living God, which is a pillar and buttress of the truth. That's a sermon for another time. God is a father, and we are his children. When you think about a household, or a family, there's an intimate union between members of the family. Between members of a family, there is the relationship which is personal. It's a vital, it's a living, it's an organic unity. The members of the household stand together, they work together, they care for one another, they share with one another, they live for one another. That's how a family works. And this relationship of being part of the family of God becomes all the more significant when we understand the marvelous and the wondrous grace of God. You know why? If God had just decided not to punish us, not to send us to hell in our salvation, it would have been a wonderful thing. Praise God. But God's way of salvation does not stop at that. A Christian is not someone who is just forgiven and saved from hell. And Paul elevates this in this passage here. And, and also in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. Could you please look at Ephesians 1 5. He says there, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. We are now adopted sons. Is only possible through Jesus Christ. None of this is possible without Christ. Without Christ, we are strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. We are strangers to the covenants of the promise of the Messiah. Without Christ, we have no hope. Without Christ, there is no hope in this world. But now in Christ, we who have been far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We are now part of the family of God. What are the privileges we have as a result of being in the family of God? Well, we're children of God. As children, we are divine partakers or partakers of the divine nature. As children, we have access, the right to approach Him always as a child has to the Father. A child doesn't have to take an appointment to meet His Father. Now we can go to God and say, My Father. Or as you say in the Greek, Abba, Father, Daddy. Without Christ, there's no relationship with God. But now He is our God, our Father. Romans chapter 8, verse 17, we read, If children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So we are fellow heirs with Christ. The God who made the world out of nothing, ex nihilo, 
The God who controls everything from eternity past to eternity now. The God who is the Lord, the King, the Sovereign God is also my Father. Yes, praise God. And He is always willing to give you undivided attention as His adopted children. Many people say, well, don't talk to me about God as my father. My father was bad. I don't want to understand and I can't understand because, well, you don't have to. Because don't compare a heavenly father with an earthly father. As earthly fathers, we are all imperfect. But our heavenly father is a perfect father. And we are his adopted children. He's always ready to receive you. Matthew chapter 6 verse 32 reads this. He says, For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So the question is, why are you fretting and worrying about anything? Why? Are you fretting and worrying this morning? You probably are. God is your heavenly father who knows all about you and your needs and all your worries much better than you do yourselves. So why not just trust in him? This is why we need to remind ourselves. I mean, Paul did that. Remember a couple of Sundays ago, we said remember was a command. Verse 11, therefore remember, we need to remember. Otherwise we forget. And when we forget what happens, we panic and we become anxious and we fret and we cry and we feel. So we are privileged, privileged to be members of God's household. So we've seen that we are fellow citizens of God's kingdom with the saints, with all the saints. We've seen that we are members of God's household. Now let's move on to verses 20 to 22. That's where we'll take the bulk of our time. It's an important place and I want to spend some time in that. We are privileged to be living stones in God's temple. Here Paul highlights another picture of the temple. It's a, it's a picture of the chem- temple or the church as a temple of God in which God dwells. Paul has transitioned from being fellow citizens of a city to being in the household of God. And now he has transitioned all the way to saying, now we belong to the temple of God. Another word picture. The church is the holy temple of God. God is dwelling within us. As the glory of the Lord dwelt in the innermost sanctuary and the temple that was made by human hands amongst the children of Israel, so now He dwells in His church among His people. I mean, if you were to track how God used the word picture to show us something really significant, He built the temple and He showed how the Spirit, the Shekinah glory, dwelt in the temple temporarily because in the book of Ezekiel, The Shekinah glory departed from the temple. And now into the New Testament, Christ comes. And he tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us. And now the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Temporarily? No, permanently. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. But God's temple is holy and you are that temple. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 we read, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own. Paul again in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16 writes, 
What agreement does the temple of God with idols? We are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is what we read in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You yourselves like living stones, not dead stones. The temple, the Solomonic temple was built out of dead stones. But you as a believer are living stones in the temple, not built by hands, but by the Holy Spirit. It says your living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are like a great building and we are blocks in the building. We are living stones in the building. But before we look at that blocks, let's look at the foundation, shall we? Because that's expository preaching. We go verse by verse. We need to work through the next part of it. So let's come back to verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2. It says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. What does the word apostle mean? The apostle is someone who has seen the risen Christ. And was specifically commissioned by Christ to go out and preach the gospel. They were given power to authenticate their power and authority by doing miracles. And to establish churches. So there were 12 capital A apostles. Keep in mind that after Judas Iscariot killed himself, Matthias was chosen to replace him in Acts. Other than Matthias, Paul was the only apostle, and he was included as an apostle. And Paul says about that as well. He says, born out of due time. He did not see the Lord Jesus at the same time as the other apostles, but he saw the vision of the risen Christ. And he was tutored by the Lord himself in the wilderness, in the desert for three years, in the Syrian desert for three years. We read about that in the book of Galatians. Apart from these, there were no other apostles. There is no apostolic succession. I mean, there is no. I mean, we can't say today, well, we have apostles today. We don't. It was for the early church. The next word in verse 20 is the word prophet. The prophet is someone who receives a direct message from God. They were given truth by direct revelation. There were prophets in the Old Testament and there were prophets in the New Testament. Here Paul specifically could be referring to New Testament prophets. He says apostles and prophets. Their unique function as prophets was to authoritatively speak the word of God to the church. And they did that before the New Testament was complete. Now the prophet did not have authority to just speak what they wanted to do. They had to be validated by other prophets as well. No prophet wrote scriptures in the New Testament times. Only apostles wrote scriptures in the New Testament times. And their direct revelation or teaching had to always correspond with the apostles teaching. And these prophets were limited to the early church period, before the completion of the New Testament. After the New Testament was completed, there was no need for prophets. There are no prophets in the biblical sense today. No apostles, no prophets. Now what does it mean that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets? It means they were the foundation. How many foundations do you build when you build a building? One. The apostles and prophets were the foundation of the church. And when we think about foundation, what does that mean? Well, we are referring to the apostolic teaching. The faith that we stand on is built on the apostolic doctrine. When we refer to apostolic doctrine, 
We are talking about the true gospel. Paul himself states in Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one who we preach to you, let him be accursed. The true gospel is always the God-centered gospel. There is a man-centered gospel which is not the gospel. It's spurious, it's fake, it's a denial of the true gospel, it's a facade. Think of this, you've seen a seesaw in a playground. If one part of the seesaw is up, where's the other one? Down. If this goes up, this side goes down. God is always at the top in the true gospel. Man is always dependent on God. Not the other way around. God is not dependent on man. That's a false gospel. Anything that declares that man is independent of God, and that God is somehow dependent on man is a false gospel, because God is sovereign, and man is always dependent on God. Is that true? Yes. And so the apostolic doctrine, the apostolic truth, always preserves the majesty of Christ, the Christ is exalted, God is sovereign, and that's the foundation on which everything rests. There cannot be true unity apart from the apostolic doctrine, the truth of God's word. There cannot be true unity. And as we do ministry here at Family Heritage Church, we want to make certain that our teaching is aligned with the apostles' teaching. This is the reason we emphasize doctrine in this church. We teach not some hobby horse, we teach the whole counsel of God's Word. Now some people would say, well there should be no doctrine in the church. Doctrine divides. Have you heard that? Let's just love one another. It does not matter what we believe. Some would say, well I find doctrine boring. I'm not a doer. I'm a doer, not a learner. So don't give me stuff. Beloved, we need doctrine. We need doctrine. To know doctrine is to know the content of our Christian faith. This is why Paul said in Timothy chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he said, Preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. The only way you and I would be able to refute and protect the truth of God's Word is by knowing the doctrines of God's Word, of the teaching of God's Word. Well, some people will say, well, let's just have... It's okay. Let's just all come together, have many viewpoints. Just learn to accept one another, love one another. Beloved, you cannot and should not accept any other truth other than the apostles' teaching. Or the doctrine found in God's Word. Now that doesn't mean we cannot have discussions of God's Word. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have discussions on the doctrines of God's Word. But ultimately, God's Word has already laid the truth down. And we just need to settle on that and accept it no matter what. It's laid to rest. You cannot build on another foundation, can you? The foundation is already laid. The apostles' teaching. So doctrine is important. Tim Chalice, a blogger, gives the following reason as to why we should emphasize doctrines. He says, doctrine helps us to love God. You will not only be able to love God deeply to the extent you know Him, you'll only be able to love God deeply to the extent you know Him. He says, doctrine leads to humility. He says, as we come to come face to face with the infinite majesty of God and our wretched sinfulness, it becomes all the more clear as to who you are. He says, doctrine leads to obedience. You can only love God as much as you know Him deeply. And the more you know Him, the more you're able to obey Him. Then he says, doctrine leads to worship. The truth of God's Word will amaze you as you dwell on the majesty and the truth of God's Word. Finally, he says, doctrine protects the church from false doctrines or false truths. 
So doctrine is important, and that's the apostles' teaching. That's the foundation of God's Word. Let's now come to the next phrase that's found in verse 20, and that is Christ Himself being the cornerstone. You know a cornerstone of the building. It's an important part of the building. It supports everything. The cornerstone finalizes the shape of the building and determines the design of the building. And who is the cornerstone here? Paul says Christ is the cornerstone of the body, the church. That means the church or the building should be in conformity to the cornerstone that's Christ. The cornerstone is literally called the testing stone. That means it's a stone by which every other stone in the building is measured. All of the stone in the building must be in line and adjust themselves to this cornerstone. Even the apostles and the prophets couldn't just make up things as they went along. They had to make sure that as they laid the foundation of the church, it was in conformity with the cornerstone. Is that clear? Because Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. It is Christ and Christ alone who settles all matters in the church. It is Christ who gives the church the needed direction. And we are to regulate our lives in accordance with the will of the cornerstone. Paul continues in verses 21 through 22. It says, In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now here he comes to the final components of the temple. The building blocks or the living stones. And we are the living stones that consists of the believers in Christ. So let's begin with the word being joined together or words in the English language being joined together. This is best translated as fitly framed together. I repeat, fitly framed together. In the English, it's three words. But in the Greek, it's one word. And what's rather strange about this word, it's, it's, it's found nowhere else in the Bible. Except here in Ephesians chapter 2, 21 and Ephesians 4, 16. Nowhere else is this word to be found. And what's rather peculiar about this word is this word is found no other place outside the Bible. It's like the Apostle Paul. He wanted to describe something really important and he made up this word in the Greek. This is what the Apostle Paul wanted to say and it was exceptionally important that he coins a new word to describe his idea. It's the word in the Greek called sun armologio. It's a double compound word. Three words joined together, made into one. By the way, if you look at it, grammar, it's in the present tense. Means it's an ongoing process. The voice is a passive voice, meaning the agent of the action is not us, but God. God is the one doing it. That means it's explaining the elaborate process that's involved by which the stones are fitted together. Now if you think about a modern day building, you probably don't see this in the United States. If you may find it, if you look at some homes that are made out of stones, here it's all made out of wood. But if you go to a place where a person actually builds a home out of stones, in ancient times, today they would just take bricks and they would just lay it in position. All the bricks are mass produced, all same shape and size, nothing to worry. You just put there, the mason would just put one brick after another and just put cement or plaster and cover it up. But in ancient days it was not so. The mason had to look at the heap of stones, look at his wall. Then he will look at the heap and he will pick one stone. Then he will look at it. He will place it in place. And then he'll say, well, it needs a little chiseling here. He would chisel that off. Chisel that off. Then he would place it back there. And then he would take another stone. 
He would take that and see if it fits well there. If it doesn't fit well, he would chisel that off a little bit and chisel off here a little bit, and then he will put it right there. Do you see what the mason is doing? Do you see the word picture that Paul has here as he's writing the words? He says, fitly framed together. A careful joining together of every component of a structure. In the same way, we as living stones of the body of Christ, God is chiseling away at our lives. God is using circumstances and trials to prune us, to make us more and more like Him. And finally, as we look at the completed structure, the church, the stones are not equal in size, nor in shape, nor in anything else. Some are big, some are medium, some are small. Yet equally well placed in the wall. They are different, yet harmoniously fitted together. No mass production. The commentator Martin Lloyd Jones writes there is a deliberate, personal, particular, individual selection, and that's true of everyone who becomes a Christian. Verse 21 continues In foam, the whole Sorry, verse 20 continues, Bill. I'm sorry, what's going on here? I'm tired. Yes, verse 21. And from the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This temple of the church is growing. It is not static. It's a living building. It's consisting of living stones of believers in Christ Jesus. It's growing. Internally, the Word of God is being taught and people are growing spiritually. They're being equipped to spiritual service through the Word of God. Growing doesn't just mean sitting around and singing Kumbaya. It's being taught the Word of God. And as you're being taught the Word of God, the whole counsel of God's Word, you grow. Not just being taught ABC every Sunday, 52 Sundays of the year. Not just being fed peanut butter jelly sandwiches every single Sunday. It is being taught the whole meat, the whole counsel of God's Word. And as you're being taught, you grow. And it affects your walk. And as you grow externally... As you grow internally, you grow externally. That means you go out and you evangelize. And as you evangelize, you spread God's word. People are saved and they're drawn into the church and the church grows. Do you see how internal and externally the church grows? And not only that, as you grow internally, as you grow individually, people around you grow as well. You want to know how? Please turn with me to First Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another, build one another, just as you are doing. Do you see what Paul is saying? As you are growing spiritually, as you're growing internally, what would you do? You will encourage one another. You will build one another. And you see how others will grow as a result of it? The church will grow as a result of it. And so we'll be able to see growth in our fellow church members as we grow spiritually. Paul continues in verse 22. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The word dwelling place, it means a permanent home, a place for settling down. Before, in the old temple, it was not a permanent place. But now God is preparing a permanent place for God by the Spirit. In the book of Ezekiel, as I told you, the Shekinah glory of God departed. It was not there permanently. But now here we read in verse 22, in this whole process, as you are being built together, 
You are being built together into a permanent place for God to settle down. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 says, Do you not know you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Folks, this church, what you talk about here, the universal church, is the body of believers. But as you look at the body of believers, we also have a tangible, real world expression of that body of believers. That is the local church. Family Heritage Church is a local church. And the local church is the vehicle that God uses to exhibit His believers here in this world. So when God wants to show the world what true believers look like, He says, look at my local church, wherever that local church is. That is why when you and I become saved, the first non-negotiable we need to do is obviously, yes, get baptized when you're saved, after you're saved. But then the next thing you got to do is find a Bible-believing church. That's important. We don't date the church. We marry the church. There's a deep-rooted commitment. Charles Spurgeon said, For a Christian, a failure to join a church is disobedience. He said, Disconnected Christians are like good-for-nothing bricks. It's important that we find a local church and we commit ourselves to the local church. Now you may ask, which church should I join? How do I settle in a church when there are so many? Joshua Harris has written a book, Stop Dating the Church. Find a copy. There are 10 principles he does, and I'll wrap with this. 10 principles in choosing a church. Number one, is this a church where God's word is faithfully taught? And may I add, not just ABCs every Sunday for 52 weeks, but the whole counsel of God's word. Two, is this church where sound doctrine matters? Not just singing Kumbaya by holding hands. Number three, is this church in which the gospel is cherished and clearly proclaimed? Number four, is this church committed to reaching non-Christians with the gospel? Is there active evangelism? Number five, is this church whose leaders are characterized by humility and integrity? That means biblical leadership. Number six, is this a church where people strive to live by God's word? Number seven, is this a church where I can find and cultivate godly relationships? Number eight, is this a church where members are challenged to serve? Number nine, this is a church that is willing to kick me out. Joshua Harris has a church where church discipline is carried out. When a person lives in continual, perpetual sin, unwilling to repent of their sin, there's church discipline. Church discipline maintains the purity of the church. Keep in mind, church discipline is not kicking someone out. Church discipline is trying to restore a person back into fellowship. And number 10 is the church I'm willing to join, as is, with enthusiasm and faith in God. Now, no church is perfect. The moment you and I get there, it makes it imperfect. May God give us the grace to find a local church, the tangible expression of the body of Christ, and be married into it. Father, we pray that you would help these dear, precious saints to walk away with the truth of God's word. And not just look at the mirror and say amen. But to find areas in their lives that needs to be corrected. That Lord we will be willing to humble ourselves. And obey your word. Exalt the bride of Christ. The church. Be committed to the bride of Christ. Instead of just dating the bride of Christ. Willing to get into a long-term relationship with the Bride of Christ. Being married to the local church, wherever we are. Yes, Father, help us in this process. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children say, Amen.